So um, the topic of this session is medical marijuana for epilepsy, and this session is generously sponsored by Henry, the Henry Ford Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. And I'm Russ Gary, the Director of Ed Education at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, and I'll be moderating this session. We are pleased to have at, with, as our panelists um, Dr. Uh, Evangelos Latinas, who is um, Chief Medical Officer at Ohm of Medicine, which is a medical marijuana dispensary in Ann Arbor. We also have um, Dr. Gregory Barkley, who is an epileptologist with the Henry Ford Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. And we also have Zahra Abbas, who is an adult uh, living with epilepsy, who's had some success using medical marijuana for epilepsy. And also Michael Comorn, who is president of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association and a lawyer at Comorn Law. So welcome and thank you all for uh, serving as panelists today. So over the past few years, <laughs> so as, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, over the past few years, medical marijuana has become a hot topic in the epilepsy community. Um, by the end of today's session, I'd like attendees to have a basic understanding of the potential benefits and risks of using medical marijuana as a treatment for epilepsy, and also the practical and legal considerations involving uh, medical marijuana, and also how to advocate for the removal of barriers uh, both to access and to research. Um, so, Dr. Barkley, can you briefly describe, um, start by describing the two different species of cannabis, uh, sativa and in indica, or indica, and the primary compounds um, that we pay attention to when we're using medical marijuana to treat epilepsy? So, uh, I, I want to first start by saying that uh, for probably three out of four people with epilepsy, marijuana is probably not something that's needed. We have standard drugs that work quite well, providing you have the right diagnosis and uh, are treated uh, with uh, the proper dosages. So, there are about 25% of people with epilepsy, unfortunately, who the standard therapy has not helped. and so. If you're somebody whose seizures have not been controlled, then it's important to make sure that you see an epilepsy specialist to get the right diagnosis and be put on the right drugs. I have been working today uh, reading EEGs, and we have transferred in a patient who has Lennox Gasto and what came from another hospital with uh, on two drugs, one of which is known to make seizures with Lennox Gasto worse. So it, and there's probably a number of people in this room who have either juvenile myoclonic epilepsy or juvenile absence epilepsy, which cause about 10% of the epilepsies uh, uh, in the general population. And those people generally will have seizures that are well controlled, provided they're on the right dose of the right medication. So the first uh, point before talking about uh, the role of cannabis is to make sure that you've had the proper diagnosis. And if your seizures haven't been controlled, you need to see an epilepsy specialist. You might need video EEG monitoring. You might actually be one uh, a patient in whom something like surgery can cure them from having cure you from having more seizures. So putting that aside, let's assume that you're somebody who's done done all of those things. And I know there are people in this room who meet all those criteria. What is the what is the the story with marijuana? How can we separate the hype from the reality? So actually, Russ, there are three kinds of marijuana plants, and okay. uh, there's actually like any classification scheme, the botanists will differ. And so there's an argument whether there's really one plant that have different varieties, just like we have different varieties of apples. But for the sake of convenience, uh, there are three plants you can think of. One is called cannabis sativa, which originally was from China. And it's a fairly tall tree, it can, uh, bush. It can grow to 20 feet tall. And it's a great source of fiber for making ropes. The, historically, the cannabis sativa had higher levels of THC, which is the, the compound in marijuana, one of the cannabinoids which make people feel high. The uh, second uh, major plant is called Cannabis Indica, and it was originally from India, so the name doesn't <coughs> surprise anybody. And it's a shorter, bushy plant, and it's often one that tends to be grown because it's a more he the size is e more easily handled. The third plant most people have not heard of is called Cannabis ruderalis, 
and it actually was a, uh, a, very, a variety that first was found growing in, in northern Central Asia and Russia. And it has a unique feature that, unlike the other two species, which have to have a certain period of daylight and darkness in order to flower, since this, uh, this form of marijuana grows farther north, it, it goes to seed in about four weeks. Now, all three of these different plants can be hybridized, and probably most of the marijuana that people will uh, purchase is a hybrid of one sort or another. But anyone that said to be auto-flowering has a cannabis uh, ruderalis as part of that because that's its prop major property. It also, uh, in the, the native form, it has almost no THC and it's all CBD, but the concentrations tend to be lower. So when you think about plants, I would think about, as I mentioned, apples. You know there are dozens of varieties of apples and there are dozens of varieties of marijuana that you can find. And so the key uh, question is what are the components in marijuana? So there are about 80 or more cannabinoid compounds in marijuana plants which uh, bind to receptors in the body called CB receptors. And there are two major CB receptors, CB1 and CB2. The CB1 receptor is uh, the one that THC, the, uh, the compound in marijuana that makes you feel high, binds to in the brain. The CB2 receptors are throughout the body and uh, binding to that doesn't uh, seem to uh, make you high. The, compound CBD or cannabidiol uh, may have some of its mechanisms through that, but there are probably some other ways that this works as well. So the cannabinoids are natural products in the body. They're found, they're the compound that makes you feel good when you've been exercising the so-called runner's high. Uh, they uh, help the body to relax, to digest, to um, forget and they are responsible for a sense of well-being. So you even find uh, some cannabinoid compounds in mother's milk. So like any compound that uh, works in the body, you, there's a dose effect. So higher doses will have a greater effect. And depending on what you're using as a, in terms of a uh, marijuana product, you may have different varieties of these 80-some compounds and they have different effects. The CBD is the one that's of most medical interest because it doesn't make you feel high. And it has both, it has pain relieving properties for nerve pain, the kind of pain like people with diabetes get when they have burning feet or after nerve injuries such as a pinched nerve in your back or neck. And it uh, also seems to relieve seizures using, in animal research, using standard uh, tests that are used to develop anti-seizure drugs marijuana alone or in combination with other seizure drugs has been shown in for more than two decades to be effective in various models of seizure control. The last thing I will say before I let stop hogging the microphone here is that there are side effects to marijuana like any other drug. And um, just because things are natural doesn't mean that they are, have no side effects. I will point out that uh, you, mushrooms are totally natural and you can kill yourself with, uh, <laughs> if you eat the wrong one, and anyone who's gone morel hunting and picked a false morel knows how sick they got instead of the real morel. So um, the uh, good news about uh, cannabinoids is that unlike some of our seizure drugs, they do not cause life-threatening liver failure or uh, bone marrow failure, but they do affect the brain and they can have effects on, on the brain and that effects are dependent upon how old you are. We know from animal research that cannabinoids uh, given to uh, pregnant uh, animals can cause uh, seizures in the developing fetus so that the, the effects in the uh, pregnant mother shouldn't use cannabinoid products. We also know that uh, with most of the research being done on THC, that THC can interfere, it certainly interferes with learning and memory and uh, complex uh, uh, processing when people are, in, when they're high on marijuana. And those effects can linger for days or weeks afterward. And in the developing brain, which um, it certainly is something that should be used with caution in, in children and teenagers, unless the benefits 
outweigh the, uh, the side effects. So as someone who's having a lot of seizures, like the famous Charlotte Fiji, where you were, she was having hundreds of seizures a month, uh, certainly the consequence of perhaps affecting her memory probably was uh, very small compared with controlling her seizures. Right. And what research is currently underway uh, or about to get underway and what do we hope to learn from this research? Can we maybe talking about the clinical trials of okay. Epidiolex. So there's a company in Britain uh, called GW Pharmaceuticals that already markets in Europe a uh, cannabinoid spray that's all CBD and it's called uh, Sativex, I think. Sativex. And it's not available in the United States. I think it's available in Canada. And it's been marketed for uh, things other than epilepsy. But they have also uh, developed, put an office in Raleigh, uh, Durham, North Carolina, and they have a marijuana oil that's all CBD that is being, has been given an orphan drug status and, by the FDA and is on a fast track uh, for uh, testing the same way any other drug is being developed for two specific conditions, Lennox Gastaut, which is the, an, a, a severe epilepsy with many seizure types and often cognitive de delay that starts in childhood, and Dravet syndrome, which is an inherited epilepsy, which is what uh, Charlotte of uh, Charlotte's Web fame has. And so those tests are underway, and at the American Epilepsy Society meeting last December, they showed some preliminary data that uh, looked promising. They haven't published any of that yet, and ongoing trials are continuing in Next month at the uh, annual epilepsy meeting of the American Epilepsy Society, we hope to hear some more about that. Okay, great. Um, and Mr. Comorn, uh, can you briefly summarize um, the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act and how this relates to current federal laws on the cultivation, possession, and use of medical marijuana? It's very easy to do, no problem. Now, for, I, want to do, I do want to thank the sponsors in, uh, for inviting me, first of all, and for putting on this event. Okay. Um, one of the stigmas that has gone along with, you know, my practice as a lawyer is just being involved in representing patients or caregivers or advocating for them. And I can tell that uh, amongst the group that we're with here that it's a, it's a highly evolved group. Uh, and uh, the, all of that, that reefer madness is, is obviously not present here today. And it's great to hear from the doctor, I, I, it, it is, it's been amazing listening because the advancements here are not what we normally hear. And, and I think more people should know about this in these kind of events. But thank you for having me. The issue of the, the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act and uh, federal law is uh, less of an issue right now, I would say. The um, federal government has defunded the Drug Enforcement Agency in this last budget to prosecute or investigate states that have medical marijuana programs. It doesn't mean that they... You know, in like for example, in some situations, what somebody would call a good network of patients and caregivers could be called a RICO uh, charge in federal court. So, the federal government has not really been prosecuting too much in the eastern side of, uh, of of Michigan. The western district, we've had a couple, or it seems to be a little bit more prevalent, but not as of late, and not uh, not at all because of the uh, budget restraints. But that doesn't mean that would change, and that's always the concern, of course. Uh, different uh, administration, different attorney generals, all different types of things can happen. The Michigan Medical Marijuana Act uh, 2008 voter initiative is uh, state law and protects only those persons that are charged with crimes under state law. The act uh, clearly states that uh, it does not attempt to protect you from federal prosecution and a uh, Supreme Court case ruling clearly states that if the federal government's going to prosecute you, they're going to prosecute you, and the Michigan Medical Marijuana will not help you in that prosecution. However, in state court, you uh, have protections from the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, and the cities and local municipalities likewise can't preclude the basic protections or, or vitiate those protections that uh, by local ordinance and you know, somehow circumvent the state protections. But the way I like to describe how the law works is uh, you have to first understand that the prohibitions 
for any behavior involving marijuana have been on the books for a long time, and they are still on the books. You know, the crimes of possession of marijuana, possession with intent to deliver, uh, delivery of marijuana, and manufacturing are the crimes that individuals will be charged with when they're engaging in uh, any marijuana activity. The Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, as our Supreme Court said, did not legalize medical marijuana in Michigan. What it did is it created two different protections, types of protections. The first one is what I like to compare to a licensing type of protection. That's our, the immunity or the, um, um, it's called the immunity or the section four protections. It, uh, it's a license, I, the, the comparison is a, a pist pistol permit, excuse me, a carrying a concealed weapon permit where an individual would not be able to carry a pistol concealed on the person if they were doing so, it's uh, punishable under Michigan law. However, if you have a license to do so, you uh, would be exempt or immune from the prosecution for that same type of behavior. If, however, you are acting outside of that license of being allowed to or exempt from uh, being charged with a crime, if you're acting outside of it, you lose your immunity protections and you could be charged just like uh, just like any other individual for that behavior. The Section 4 uh, or the immunity protections of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act work the same way. There are statutory limitations, enumerated amounts that people can possess, um, the number of plants that people can possess, the direction of the transfers and what is allowed and what's protected from arrest, and it's challenging to a lot of people and it's important. There's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of people over the years have gotten in trouble for just not knowing the law, thinking that, uh, mistakenly thinking that they were uh, in conformity with. I never discourage people from participating in the program. I'm a big uh, proponent of people who are interested in it and um, it can be done in a way that uh, w would not bring people uh, in any kind of risk or liability. So, I, so what, the stories that I tell are not to scare anybody, and I am encouraging. It's just that you have to know and understand that uh, the dynamics of what's involved. So this immunity provision, did you want? No, go ahead. All right. the, the immunity provision is, uh, allows for individuals who are patients, after they've been recommended by a physician to use cannabis, that they can possess uh, 12 plants, growing 12 plants. I don't always recommend if you're, you know, that you, you, get, no one says you have to have 12 plants and therein lies some of the problems when you start getting, you know, up to the edge of, of what you're allowed to do. I always say scale back and, you know, um, understand the limitations. And the quantities that you're allowed to possess is uh, 2.5 ounces of usable marijuana. This usable marijuana is a huge debate in the state of Michigan right now, I guess, in the courts, I would say. And, uh, <coughs> You know, but there are, but the basic concept is as you're harvesting your plants, you want to try to vision how much you're going to have and what the yield's going to be and, and understand how it's going to dry and, and cure and, and be ready for usability. But um, for those individuals that are outside of this, these limitations, if you are acting outside of the license, your, your card's expired, you happen to have harvested uh, from your plants and you have more than 2.5 ounces for a patient or caregivers, uh, are only allowed, they're limited to selling and delivering to only five enumerated people. If they sell to a sixth patient, that would be behavior that's outside of the protections of the Michigan Med Medical Marijuana Act. But you have an affirmative defense, and this is where uh, most of the litigation has been. It's been, been in, it, that's gone through the courts and the Supreme Court recently ruled on a couple cases, but it's the ability of those individuals who may, by necessity, by needing more marijuana to make some of the concentrates, by you know not having safe access and, and going to a sixth, uh, you know, uh, you know, trying to acquire from someone that the law doesn't directly allow. Those kind of things happen all the time. But the act itself allows for an affirmative defense, where the individual doesn't necessarily deny the behavior and say I didn't do it. They say I did do it, and then they explain uh, why it was medically necessary. But this issue of how that happens has been the most, most litigated. Okay, great. And what, what legal recourse, oh, go ahead. 
I just want to add that I talked to a DEA agent in the past year and said, what have you been instructed to do about marijuana, medical marijuana? He said, we've been told that as long as people are following the state law to leave them alone. So if you grow 40 acres of marijuana, then you're going to be in trouble. If you put a, you fill up a U-Haul, you're going to be in trouble. If you try and go on an airplane with a bunch of marijuana, you're going to get in trouble. But if you have a small amount that you're using for medical purposes, I think you can relax and not worry about it. As long as you have a card, you have to get a card. Right, right. Um, what legal recourse is there for medical marijuana patients who fail a drug test for employment? Does that come up ever? It happens quite a bit. In fact, if I would complain about the things that need to be rectified, it would be the employment issue, housing, and the driving, you know, the fear of, of, of the driving. All of those things directly impact patients, both for growing, if they're going for themselves, and also using. Um, the law has not been favorable on this issue. There's a case in Michigan, it was a Walmart versus a you know, heroic, uh, he was a cancer patient, he was employee of the month at one point and hurt his knee and was off for a while. And they, as a matter of course, drug test before they come back to work, he tested positive for cannabis because he had been certified by his cancer doctor to utilize and they fired him. It uh, got removed, the case was sued in state court, they got removed to federal court, and of course there is no medical marijuana in federal court, so it got thrown out. And it essentially had no protection. Then it's, it's a problem. There is a solution though, which is that if uh, the federal government were to deschedule, um, remove it from the uh, controlled substance, uh, and I think that's kind of your next question, but um, that would, that, that's one of the possible solutions. Okay. Uh, w one other question that wasn't actually on your guide, but I thought of it after, <laughs> was um, if, if uh, a school refuses to give a child uh, C CBD oil, for example, if they've been prescribed it, it, is there any legal recourse in that situation? That's an untapped area. That, it's an interesting, uh, and, and I would say, I didn't mention before, the CPS issue is a area that is also uh, in conflict, uh, unfortunately, and I'm in a couple cases involving that. I would think that, uh, you know, it's assuming that the doctor support is there, any school is going to have a very, very difficult time stopping that from happening legally. You know, whatever their reasons may be, you know, it, 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 there, shouldn't, it, you know there shouldn't be a discrimination if they're going to let a child use another medication. Yeah, go ahead. I think from a medical point of view, <clears throat> I think from a medical point of view, there aren't very many situations where a child should need to have that in school because the half-life of CBD is about nine hours long. That means that um, if you gave a dose at, uh, <clears throat> at 9 a.m., the concentration would fall to about 50% of that level by uh, 5 p.m. So that half-life is roughly the same half-life as Tegretol. And many of you know that uh, it's much more convenient to give children your dose of medicine in the morning before they go to school and when they get home than to get the school involved because then all, with all those hassles. So fortunately, the half-life is long enough that for most children this shouldn't be an issue. That's a great point. Okay, and, uh, Ms. Ms. Abbas, um, can you um, tell me what the key factors were that were involved in your decision to uh, try medical marijuana? Well, cannabis? there was... There were several key factors involved. Um, one of them was trying several things like the VNS and um, brain surgery. And I had tried several medications. So the next thing was um, there was what was left to do. And um, we talked about this. And this was one of the things before trying any more medications. And at first, I was reluctant to, do, to try this um, just because of all the things you hear about it. But um, after talking with my doctor and with other people, I was like, okay, I'll try this. And um, so that was. Okay. okay. And, and once you made that decision, what subsequent steps did you have to take to get where you are now? What types of things did you have? To, what forms did you fill out? Where did you, how did you identify? a dispensary to use? How did you figure out the dosing? So uh, the first thing that I had to do was fill out the papers um, for the, the application. Thank you. Um, first thing I had to do was fill out the application, which was um, which part of it had to be filled out by me and the, the rest had to be filled out by my doctor. And after that, um, 
I looked around for um, a dispensary and I settled on Home of Medicine in Ann Arbor. And um, that was after looking at several dispensaries and I had heard about that and my doctor, Dr. Zilke, had also knows about that. And that was part because you, Dr. Barkley, had visited there also. So um, I just visited there and they, um, helped with picking out the strain because I needed something to start off on a low THC, um, I mean high CBD, uh, something that didn't have really THC and I worked um, to get to a higher CBD something because at first I was working with just a tincture and then I started going up to, I went up to capsules um, a cons which has a consistent dose uh, I take five milligrams in the morning and 10 milligrams at night. And then for um, the rest of the time, I take an oil. And since starting the cannabis, um, I've been able to stop the Ativan and Tylenol or anything else for pain. Thanks. And I also went through in DC, I broke my hand because I didn't have the cannabis then. And um, I also went through surgery and I was able to recover f through both of those without anything um, for pain. Okay, great. And we'll talk more about uh, your experience with, with, it, with seizure control uh, a little later. So thank you. Um, Dr. Barkley and Dr. Latinas, can you um, talk briefly about the different ways in which medical marijuana can be taken into the body and the relative pros and cons of each? Why don't you start? Okay, sure. Um, first of all, I want to thank again the, the uh, sponsors for having us here. It's a fantastic event, so thank you for having us. Uh, as far as the methods of administration, like any other medication, there's a lot of different ways you can put the medication in your body. Uh, there are basically three or four major ones. One is obviously inhalation, either smoking or, or uh, vaporization of the medicine. Vaporization is actually a little bit uh, better and healthier for your body. Uh, the second way is by sublingual use or tincture, putting the medication under your tongue. And the third major one is by eating it, ingestion. Now, the different methods of administration have a little bit different uh, timings that the, that the medication goes through your body. So, for example, if you require very fast acting dose, smoking or inhalation is very, very good. If you want, still have, want a fast acting medication but you don't want to smoke or you have a problem with your lungs, you can use a tincture. And for long term kind of uh, medication, like Dr. Barkley was saying earlier, eating is the best method of administration. So, um, you have to think about uh, as a patient when the, our patients come to our to our to home, um, you know, to sit down and, and explain times of, of, of administration, how long does it, the medication stay in your body, how it's metabolized through your body, and through that, and then obviously what types of conditions or, or symptoms we're trying to take care of, and we can basically educate our patients on how to take and when to take and how much to take. Okay, did you want anything? Let me just add a few little things. Um, I'm sure a lot of you in the room are saying, what is a vaporizer? So if you burn the, the leaves of, uh, or the, of the marijuana plant, uh, you'll get uh, all the things of the burning products, just like if you smoke a cigarette. But it turns out that the uh, cannabinoid compounds vaporize into the air at a lower temperature than the plant actually burns. So there are these there are cookers called vaporizers, which are either battery operated or electrically operated, that are little like little toasters that heat it up to the point where the uh, CBD or THC goes into the vapor, and then you breathe it in, so you don't get a lot of the other toxins from cigarette smoke, as uh, as he mentioned. If you if you inhale these vapors, it gets into your brain within seconds. Um, if you use it into your, uh, if you if it gets absorbed through your mucous membranes, either in your tongue, under your tongue, or through the nose, um, just like or uh, as people are here are familiar with diastat, those those absorption pathways don't get uh, processed in the same way that foods that are sw uh, swallowed, because when you're swallowed, they go through the liver and it takes about half an hour to get into your system. So if you're thinking about a drug with a half life of nine hours. You know, 
taking it two or three times a day is a reasonable way to do this and on a chronic basis uh, using it as a as a liquid capsule or and just eating it is the probably the way to go for most patients i would say that of the patients that i have um, there are a few people who uh, smoke or use vaporizers, but the vast majority use uh, oral preparations. Most of the people who smoke were people who were either cigarette smokers before, and I haven't harassed them enough to stop smoking, um, or they were using marijuana uh, uh, for the, to get high before they discovered it had a uh, medical benefit for the CBD oils. Great. Um, so because it's unregulated and because so many different factors can affect the chemical composition of, of the product, the strain, the grower, the extraction method, inactive ingredients, how can patients be sure that they're getting consistently what they expect uh, in terms of the quality, the quantity, the ratio of CBD to, to THC and that type of thing? Tough question. <laughs> Sorry. But Sure, I, I can you first. Um, first of all, I, I we always tell our patients to self-educate themselves. You you are the, the the best kind of proponent for yourself is to self-educate. So when you go to a dispensary, you're trying to figure out where to get your medication. Get a, go to a dispensary that test their medications first and foremost. So for us, for example, it's very important that all of our medications are tested, and we know exactly what our you know what's in the medication that our our patients put in their body. So uh, the main thing, like I said, is either uh, try to educate yourself and use, uh, go to a dispensary that you, you know, feel that you're comfortable with, um, that they make sure that they know when you educate yourself and you ask the correct questions, you know, they know the correct answers. And mainly when you actually purchase or, or get the medication that all of those medications are tested um, in an outside third party laboratory testing facility that you know that, you know, everything is kosher, so to speak, and take it from there, you know. Okay, great. Did you want to add anything? So anybody who's ever grown tomatoes knows that uh, every year it's a different story, uh, and even from week to week it's a different story. So the problem with marijuana uh, is that, to a certain extent, it's the Wild West out there. And it's a natural product, and there's going to be variation. And uh, the only way to know exactly what you're getting is if you have had some testing done on the product you're taking. So this is different than the medication. If I gave you a milligram, 100 milligrams of a pill, no matter what it is it's been, that's been FDA approved, then you know that it's going to have as little as 80 milligram or as much as 125 milligrams. That's what the FDA manufacturing standard is. If you go buy an over-the-counter vitamin, or herbal product, there's no assurance that it even has any of that in there because there are no regulations that run, is, it's regulated by the Department of Agriculture and there's been one scandal after another of things that are supposed to have this or that and testing shows they don't have any of that. But fortunately for marijuana, there are laboratories around who will do testing with gas chromatographic analysis in great detail and will tell you exactly what's in a product uh, and many of my patients who have been on uh, marijuana products will bring in uh, certificates saying this is what's in this product. The, um, one of the things that has confused people though is that I've had, I remember a patient had two bottles of the same product and uh, they had to go from three and a half uh, drops to f or mLs to four mLs and, and, and they, had, they didn't understand why and so I had to carefully explain to them that that the, the newer bottle had a different uh, potency than the older bottle. So you have to be careful about, about this. But again, uh, with a bit of caution and knowing what you're dealing with, you can, uh, you can uh, figure out so you can kind of get a consistent dose. The other thing is, is if you're using dispensaries, uh, you have to be careful because some of the dispensaries are much more attuned to helping people with medical problems than others. And so I always advise people to use kind of the, uh, the gut test. You walk into a place and if it feels kind of shady, then turn around and go someplace else. <laughs> because you really don't know what you're dealing with. And, uh, and, and I would say that uh, most of the places that are dealing with medical marijuana and the, and the ones that you hear from 
from your uh, friends or neighbors who are using it, they'll, they'll steer you to and away from certain places based upon experience. And so word gets out. There's plenty of stuff on the internet that does evaluations. And if you look around, you can actually go and find names of uh, places that do analysis, and they'll point you to uh, dispensaries that, uh, that use their analysis in the products that they sell. So there's ways to get become an informed consumer. Great, great. So um, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the high CBD, low THC strain called Charlotte's Web, and I've even heard of uh, stories of people moving to Colorado to get this, but there are actually several other high CBD, low THC strains available, and can you talk briefly about these and what, if anything, we know about their relative effectiveness? Uh, one of the one of the statements that we could have made to every one of these questions uh, has to do about marijuana products is that more research is needed. Yeah. And um, there, the, uh, there's been a fair amount of animal research on a lot of the things we've talked about, but the Schedule I FDA classification saying that it has no medical value has been a real barrier to being able to do the same kind of research that we would do with the CBD as we would with any other potential drug. So I'm gonna make one pitch to everybody in this room who's a voter is that when the 2016 elections approach and you're gonna be uh, having politicians asking you to vote for him or her for whatever position, whether it's local or uh, statewide or federal, Ask them what their position about it, changing the schedule of, mar of marijuana from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. Because that's the thing that would unlock research more than any other single thing. It would change, change it. Uh, it would be a night and day game changer for being able to do better studies and get more information that would really help you as a patient. So. That's, uh, I've gone on so long about this, I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> Just about, about the different, different strains okay, available. Okay, so, so does anybody here know what the name <clears throat> that Charlotte's Web uh, Oil was originally named? It was called Hippie's Disappointment. Because <laughs> it had almost no THC and it was all CBD. And it doesn't make you feel high at all. And, uh, um, and they, uh, they have pledged that the, uh, that the ratio of uh, THC, that there's no more than 0.03% or something THC in, in Charlotte's Web Oil. But there are many uh, CBD strains that are high in CBD are available. And I think that, um, the, as I said, there are 80 other compounds that are uh, cannabinoids in marijuana plants. So, None of these things are purely CBD unless they've gone through a very concentrated purification process like C, uh, GW Pharmaceuticals is, and so there's a mixture of things. And since everybody's chemistry is a little bit different, what works for one person may not work as well for another, and I saw a patient just uh, this week who uh, has on her third, different, her third uh, high CBD preparation. So I would say that if you're trying marijuana, the, the two things that you need to do is you keep careful records of your seizure counts, just like you would if you were in, involved in any kind of other change in your medications, and also records of the side effects that you might feel in terms of memory and concentration and sleep and pain and all kinds of things like that. And, and then, uh, keep track of what the dose you were using of the product at the time that you were having those benefits or side effects. And if it doesn't work at a dose that starts to give you side effects, then <clears throat> it's time to change. So if you think about any epilepsy drug, whether it's a approved FDA drug or a cannabinoid, the, the, the logic is quite simple. If you're having seizures, you need more medication. If you're having side effects, you need less medication. And if you're having both, then it's time to look at a different medication. Dr. Latinas, did you have something uh, to add? Just a, f uh, a few little points here. The first of all, um, uh, Charlotte's Web is a very, very beneficial strain, but it's basically because it was featured, and like you said here in the WIS documentary, a lot of people know about it, but it's not the only strain that has really high CBD. It's just the best marketed or well-known out there. So 
again, educate yourself, figure out if, if you're thinking of going to the dispensary, you know, call them and see, do they have other strains you know, that are very high in CBD? So for example, we use mainly a strain called catatonin number four, very, very high, over 12% CBD, less than 1% THC. There are strains out there that are available for our patients. Uh, we just have to, again, people know more about Charles Webb just because it was on TV, but that's not necessarily the only high CBD strain. They're out there and, and you know, we just have to search and find them. But you know, we, we use a, a lot of different strains with high CBD. Okay, great. Um, so because health insurance doesn't cover medical marijuana, cost can be a major barrier to using it. I, I know it varies, but what would you say the approximate cost per month would be for the average patient, patient with epilepsy to use medical marijuana? And obviously you can't get specific, sure. but ballpark it. How, how, roughly how much are people having to pay? Again, it depends on, on the patient. Each patient is different. Each condition is different. Um, so again, from, from literature reading and what we've seen with our patients, an adult with an epileptic disorder, he should expect between 150 to $300, something like that, per month. Obviously, for us, we have a policy. We try to help our patients the best we can. But you know, it, it is expensive. We understand that. So again, if, as, if you're a patient and you have the ability to grow your own uh, flower, do that. You know, educate yourself how to do that and create your own edibles. Um, that's the power that you have. Um, but overall, for us, what we've seen is around 150 to 300 dollars to start with. Again, depends how much you require, how often do you require, you know, or something like that. And do do many dispensaries sell seeds? And um, again. Some do, some don't. Okay. We have non-feminized seeds if that's specifically for us, but again, okay. it's, uh, you can find the seeds and, and the um, uh, cuttings of cannabis is easier to find than some of the medications, but um, right. you, you can do that, yes. Right. But I imagine it's quite challenging to, to, <laughs> to grow your own and right. do it consistently. So as I said, the most strains of marijuana to grow have to have a certain it's just like trying to get a poinsettia off to the flower a second time. You have to have a certain amount of daylight and a certain amount of darkness. And if you don't do the conditions right, then it won't, it won't blossom. The auto flowering ones have the benefit of uh, going to seed in, a, in about a month. So the other thing about growing marijuana is that, uh, that uh, it's, if you have a green thumb, you have the right conditions, you'll have uh, better results than if you don't know what you're doing. And so there's plenty of help on the internet or I'm sure at these supply stock shops to give you a hand on that, and that probably is the cheapest way to go. Um, so if you're gonna grow it, you need to keep it protected. I had a patient last year who came in and was upset because he had been growing marijuana in his backyard, which you're not supposed to do, uh, and just before harvest, somebody came and stole it. <laughs> so so you, if you're going to grow it, you should grow it in a protected place in your house in a way that uh, you won't have somebody waiting till the right moment to swoop in and take it away from you. Good point, good point. Uh, Mr. Comorn, if people want to advocate for increased access to medical marijuana, um, better research and eventual FDA approval, what bills in, at the state and federal level uh, should they ask their legislators to support? I think at the federal level, which is the major problem, um, there's a bill recently introduce, introduced uh, that would de-schedule and allow the states to then determine how they wanted to deal with marijuana. Um, Michigan already has a law that has essentially rescheduled marijuana as a Schedule II. It's a law that uh, came out of Senate Bill 660, and it's conditioned upon the federal government taking some action, either rescheduling to two or descheduling, or giving approval to the states. Any one of those combination of factors, Michigan already has a law that would run as a, and it's, almost, it's a pharmaceutical um, medical marijuana program where because it's a Schedule II, they can then sell it out of pharmacies, and they would contract out the growing of it to various, uh, there's a Canadian company that had come down and uh, advocated and lobbied for that law to get passed. So that's already in place in Michigan, if and when that So if that happens, Michigan could move forward with that. Um, I would say this, you know, the next thing I'm gonna say, it doesn't usually come up, and I know sometimes, you know, in the national uh, perspective, the medical and the legalization communities don't always go together, and, and I know, 
Uh, they've been in conflict in other states and caused, you know, prevented some of the legislation from going forward. But um, I think, you know, there's some ballot initiatives that are being passed around right now. If anyone was going to get involved in something, and I say this because I've seen, you know, some of the nuance minutia that people may get caught up in that's really silly and ridiculous, and we're talking about being crimes. You know, you're talking about medicine, and we're talking about uh, public health that is being enforced by public safety. There's a real disconnect there. And uh, for the sake of all the patients, and I think this is just from experience of many patients that, if not themselves, they've seen in the community, they'd all advocate for a legalization so that there's no limitations that a patient would, you know, have in terms of their medical use and, and interacting with a doctor or what have you. So there's one particular organization that we're supporting, Am I Legalized, that would be much more uh, um, free, freer for patients to uh, engage and uh, less restrictions that people traditionally get in trouble for, but I'd, I'd suggest those particular things. Also, um, you know, just for anyone that is engaging as a patient or thinking about becoming a patient, whatever I've said, you should know this, that patients can acquire from anybody. Whatever those limitations are, there's none for patients. Even if a patient was to acquire off a street corner, that acquisition by them is a protected act. I'm not advising that, but I say that just to emphasize that of all the things that patients are the law does intend to protect them, and it does and should. Um, and the uh, final point, I think, was that um, it's, I think the doctor hit it on the head, that the uh, problems that we're having and the, the advancements, the evolved people that we're here discussing are all limited by the scheduling of, uh, of cannabis as a Schedule One. So that's, it's, 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 a, it's a ridiculous concept. It's actually, I think we could all agree, it's intellectually dishonest. When the medical marijuana bill was uh, voted on in the state of Michigan, it, it passed in every county of the state. It was a majority vote every county, no matter how liberal or conservative. 3.3 million votes. And, and uh, there are three bills. Uh, there, I, I know of at least three um, uh, bills being prepared or in the rumor to being prepared to have another vote for 2016. Two are being prepared by Republican groups and one by a Democratic group because they, each group thinks that this will bring voters to the polls to vote for their presidential candidate, even though we don't know who the candidates are going to be. So uh, there's a political angle behind this, and, and whatever comes on the ballot, you're going to have to read carefully, because as you saw in Ohio, the wording of it that was rejected for marijuana was they were going to give a monopoly to, I think, a dozen uh, wealthy business owners so that nobody else could uh, could sell marijuana in the state of Ohio. And the voters wisely said this is ridiculous. So uh, if things come up to vote, be careful and read the proposition to make sure you know what you're voting for. Dr. Latinas, did you have anything to add in terms of bills? That Not really. Again, okay. our, our main focus is self-educate. As a patient, you, you have rights, know your rights. Read, like you said, uh, uh, my fellow panelists here, read the, the laws that are the, going into the ballots, know what you're voting for, right. and take, you know, edge. Okay. And Ms. Ab Ms. Abbas, um, it may be too soon for you to reach any conclusions, but, um, and obviously yours is only one case, but, but what has your experience so far been with, with uh, using medical marijuana and, and in terms of its effectiveness for epilepsy? Um, well, so far, personally for me, it's been, um, it's done really good. And um, I've been, like I said before, I've been, um, yesterday marked seven months seizure free for me on it. <laughs> and the one time I had a setback was early on. I had been two months seizure free already, but I had a trip to DC and well, I couldn't take it with me because of the federal laws. So I had a seizure there and I actually broke my hand, but when I came back, um, I did not take any pain pills because I had stopped using Ativan and anything for pain at that time since I started using the cannabis. And that was the first thing I got through without um, using anything for pain. And when I had my recent surgery, um, for to replace the VNS, I once again um, got a topical to use for the pain, and 
I was able to also uh, not use any Tylenol or, or anything like that for the pain because um, I used the medical cannabis instead. And so I've been like, I haven't started, I haven't started um, going down on any of my main medications, but uh, the Tylenol and Ativan, uh, that was a big relief to stop. And, um, and like uh, my headaches have gone down too because the seizures have gone down. So those are two big things. Right. Okay. Okay, before we open it up for, to questions, does anyone have any concluding thoughts on this topic that you'd like to share? Sure, no, and again, uh, for us is, uh, thank you, was like, um, again, educate yourselves, be, be, uh, know what you're looking for, what are the, the conditions that, that you're trying to, you know, take care of, and then just come and figure out exactly when to take it, how to take it, you know, um, and be a, an educated person uh, uh, patient, you know, that's uh, it's one of our major kind of drive, start to educate our patients about what cannabis can do for you. Um, just, you know, it's it's coming, it's obviously, and it, people are finding relief with that. It's just, uh, again, it's scheduling and all that, so it's slowly but steadily it's coming uh, and becoming more and more uh, prevalent, so. Okay, yeah. I think it's always important to, to point out that uh, that marijuana has mostly been used for getting high, and that's been the high THC strains. And those strains do have cognitive side effects when you're high. They may persist and interfere with learning. And there is a group of people who become dependent on marijuana when they use it on a regular basis with the high THC strains. We need more research on CBD. Oh, uh, pure CBD, and, and so we don't know exactly how much of the cognitive effects it has from talking with patients. They seem to indicate to me that they don't feel anything when they are using high CBD oils, but we need more research on that. We also don't know if people become dependent on them and what happens if you, uh, do you need to stay on this forever uh, or not, depending on the kind of epilepsy you have. So there's a, there are a lot of unanswered questions. And as we've discussed many times, there are a lot of variables that go into this that make it a, a difficult choice. It's something you need to think clearly about uh, if you're thinking about using marijuana. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for all of your expertise and your opinions on this topic. Okay. And we are going to open it up for questions yep. now. And, uh, please raise your hand and keep your questions short because a lot of people want to talk and have questions. So I'll go over here first. Thank you. Hey, are you ready? All right. All right. Like I say, please keep it short. Yes, sir. Oh, man, hold on. See, that's my... Hello. But, see, that's what my medication's doing to me now, and I hate that feeling. But um, I want to break it down in one. Um, I just want to say, because, you know, I, I'm from the area. I know the, um, they sell medical marijuana in the neighborhoods, but I feel like that's, that's the government making money, but why make a living when we sell guns and kill each other? I feel like they don't care about one's health, but they want to care. they want to kill each other. That's war. And, you know, I don't like that feeling that you want to legalize guns, but you don't want to help people. That, that's why I want to break it down. That's all. With their health. That's all. I just want to break it down. I, I, I know I have a lot to say, but I, I just want to break it down <laughs> with that one. All right. Thank you. All right. Come over here. When you say dependent, is that the same as addicted? So... Um, I don't think it's, the, the addiction is different than say someone who is using a drug like heroin um, uh, or nicotine for a smoker. Uh, you can become, there are, there are many kinds of ways you become dependent on things and it uh, it'd probably be more like someone who uh, it gets used to their morning coffee and if you don't have it, uh, uh, in, in some people, that would be a more a, more of a thing. But there are clearly people who really uh, get intense cravings. Uh, it's a small percentage, but it's not a zero percentage. And that's why 
um, particularly with the, the THC, and, and you, so when you think about the, the objections people have made to marijuana, it's because they think about these are a bunch of people who want to get high and uh, don't do anything and you know, act like Cheech and Chong all day long. <laughs> so, so uh, or any of the other stoner movies. So, uh, because there are so many different compounds, one has to try and separate medical stuff from people who are using it to just get high. And I think if you start to analyze the, when you hear people talking about it, you can figure out, are they talking about people who are getting high, or are they talking about it for medical purposes? Can I, well, can I add one questions? more thing about that? As far as dependence that we see, especially if you're a, a healthy patient, right, a healthy individual that's trying cannabis, um, dependency, again, like it was basically like a cup of coffee or something like that. There's, there's, for what we've seen, what I've read in the medical literature, there's not like the, the addiction kind of process, biological process that are going on with some other medications and not as intense as the, like opioids or you know, things like that. So it's, it's much safer medication. Again, it's not with, with no side effects or no issues, but overall much, much safer than a lot of the medications that our patients put in their bodies. I'm a jurist doctorate, so I feel comfortable saying this. Um, it's supposed to be, it's less addictive than tobacco, less addictive than alcohol, less addictive than coffee, caffeine. No uh, recorded deaths in the history of humankind. Sure. I mean, we've got, you know, prescription pill epidemic. There's two million people in the state of Michigan that are currently uh, treating and seeking, seeking treatment for chronic mm -hmm. pain. That's, you know, large number of people that are going to be taking opiates sure. and whatnot. It is a viable, I mean, it's a viable medicine. Yeah. As, as no, for sure, and, and, and the, the issue here is, uh, again, scheduling, schedule one, we can, there needs to be more research to really show that clearly and scientifically that that's the case. Um, but overall, you know, it's, it's not as addictive as, or. or I, I think no. that if you smoke marijuana every day, that it will do damage to your lungs, just like if you smoke cigarettes every day. So um, I think, like anything, if you use a reasonable amount uh, and take proper precautions, it, the safety of this is uh, is uh, far greater than um, some of the drugs that we prescribe. Um, and the other thing that we haven't talked about is that one has to be careful when starting to use uh, cannabinoids because uh, they do affect the metabolism in the liver, this, just like if you add a new anti-seizure drug. So, um, I don't want to get into too many details, but it, the metabolism of drugs to the liver can be influenced by marijuana compounds, just as as a as, as when you add other anti prescribed anti seizure drugs affects the levels. So, um, in small doses, not so much. In higher doses, there are varying effects, and and uh, so there are other things to consider about that. And I, we don't have time to go into the details. Okay, so let's move on uh, to the next Dr. question. Dr. Litness, um, in the pursuit of uh, getting a consistent product, you've said that there, you can be sent out to labs, but I mean, how is it tested like that? Is there a, is there a one pound thing that's tested and then all that strain is called good or do they test it five times a week or do they, I mean, we, how, how do we know that it's a consistent product? The way we know about it is we have specific batches, okay, of oh, Medicaid. It depends. It depends. I mean, it, it, there's not necessarily the amount of the batch. The point is that there are batches that we test, okay? And per batch, we know exactly what's in, in there. So some, from batch to batch, there might be variations over the percentage of cannabinoids within each batch or each oil that you get. And if you know that, if you test them correctly, then you can actually go ahead and say, okay, if in, in the first batch is X amount of, of percentage of cannabinoids, don't then that this is your dose. In the next batch, it might be a little bit less, a little, mid, a little bit more, then you adjust your, your dosing accordingly. The point is that you, we test every batch of medication that is in our dispensary, and we know exactly how much our patients get from batch to batch to batch. Let me just elaborate a little bit on that. If uh, the highest concentration of cannabinoids are in the, at the tips of the plants, just, and so think about broccoli or asparagus. You know, the best part is that, the top part, right? So the rest of the plant, if you ate the other, uh, a, the stalk of a broccoli plant, it still has some broccoli flavor, but it has other, you know, the fibers and all that other stuff. So the way commercial growers prepare this is they will take and harvest the plants and they take the choicest parts and sell those like a delicacy uh, to people who want to pay extra money for that. And then they take the rest of it and they chop it all up and they boil it in an oil 
it, it could be vegetable oil, it could be olive oil, any kind of oil, and the cannabinoids go into the oil layer, and then they, they, they put it through a filter, get rid of all the plant parts, and, now, and separate the water layer from the oil layer, and then they purify that and process it. Once they have that processed, let's say they have 10 gallons of it, that's the batch that he was mentioning, and then they can test the batch, and then they put it in individual bottles, they know exactly what's in it. So that's why you want to be careful uh, and to, to avoid the uh, variation from you know, one, one purchase to the next by trying to see if, does it, has your grower done any kind of analysis? Can, you, can the grower show you the paper so you know what you're getting? And that way you know you're getting more or less a consistent amount of medication. Okay, next question. Uh, hi there, I'm a patient and a caregiver. My question is, I guess, a legal question. When it comes to medicals, that's how I medicate. I don't prefer smoking it. Um, is medicals protected under the law to where if I wanted to deliver to one of my patients, and let's say instead of an ounce, he wants a dozen cookies, is that protected under the law as well? It's a complicated answer. Uh, there's a, one case I actually represented the individual on his appeal to the Supreme Court, which the court chose not to take. But this issue of what is usable marijuana and what is not usable marijuana, um, some of the law enforcement agencies are in fact uh, calling out anything that is not plant materials being not something that you're protected or immune from arrest. This of course creates a tremendous number of problems for the uh, pediatric patients because you know, the parents are not having them smoke bongs, you know, they're either adjusting other types of... Uh, um, you know, I guess the safest way to be if you're going to do that is to carry an amount that's less than the amount you're lawfully allowed to carry, whatever your, your uh, cards would allow you to. 15 ounces would be no more than, so if you're going to have 15 ounces of brownies, it can't be more than, once you get over that amount, that, that, but um, also, you know, there are transport laws in Michigan, you know, they conflict, but, but just take steps. I always advise people, take steps to not rely on your card, you know. Try to go about it as if you don't need to pull out your card, and only if you really have to. So, you know, you don't have to label it. It doesn't have to look like medical cannabis. You know, it just could be brownies that you're coming home from a wedding from. You know, you took care of something to that. So keep, so keep those things in mind, and uh, the culture of security is always the, the best approach to those kind of things. Okay, other questions? Um, how effective can um, the word medical marijuana be for a certain person exactly? How effective can it be for people? Yeah, like how, okay. like, how could it help someone, I guess? Okay, so I guess... So are you talking about for seizures? So right now we have um, individual reports from various patients who say that it did nothing to help them to that it's been uh, dramatic and they've become seizure-free and everything in between. So uh, uh, the only way to do this is to keep close records and, and have a chart your seizures, uh, try the medication. This is, I would look on this, if, you're going, if you've made the decision to try uh, high CBD marijuana, then I would look at it just like if you had been, decide to take a new anti-seizure medicine from your doctor and keep track of how you feel, how many seizures you're having, and, and relative to the dose and try and make a decision, is this making a difference or not? Can I add one more thing? Just on cannabis in general, and when you, when you have, as an epileptic patient, you have obviously a lot of different medications. When you start taking cannabis, don't immediately take out other medications. Be very steady. Let your, your neurologist and your epidemiologist know why, what you're doing and what you're planning to do. So, you know, it, you just have to protect yourself and, and do this in, in a correct kind of methodical way. Write everything down. Um, really, really educate again yourself of what you're trying to do. And, and, you know, allow the team that is helping you, you know, help you and understand what's going on. Okay, question. Here. I have more of a legal question. We take care of pediatric patients, and is there any, like, regarding CPS and ramifications for families regarding documentation of the medical marijuana? Because it's not necessarily coming from our providers, so is there any kind of backlash for the families as far as that goes, and how do we know what to put in the chart? Well, the 
CPS would not be involved unless someone makes a complaint. And when there's a complaint made, they are required by law to investigate. So if somebody knows that there's medical marijuana being used in the home, it may create issues. I mean, if, for whatever reason, someone falsely thinks it's a concern or... Right. I mean, it, not having any contact with law enforcement, you know, just avoiding those kind of things. Like, you know, it, the, the patient activity can go on privately and should go on privately, and only if there's it becomes an issue where there's you know some something that would draw attention. You know, someone gets uh, you know gets in trouble or they come to the house and there's. Uh, too much marijuana or something to that effect. But mo most of the time, as long as you're not uh, it ro you know, acting in the areas that are going to draw attention or legal consequences, you should be, you know, the pediatric patient should be fine. I, can I come out on that? I think that, you know, the, the biggest problem uh, probably comes when, when families are going through divorce or things like that, where there's a dispute between members of the family. and. We've all heard stories of people doing the most ridiculous things in fights uh, during the divorce proceedings. And so some people will stop at nothing to try and make their case better by, uh, and can say anything. But I think if you're working with your doctor and, uh, you're, and keeping your doctor informed what you're doing and so that there's good medical documentation of the reasons why this is being used, then you're going to be on much better ground than if you just decide to do this on your own. Okay. Question here, Karen. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I speak with people with epilepsy that are on marijuana. They live in one state. Their neurologist that they were seeing refused to give it to them, and they're going to another neurologist out of state, and he does he delivers it to their state. Is that legal now? If the state if the state law does not have a medical marijuana program, then they're just going to be possessing some illegal substance. It's so it's contraband unless there's a Exemption for the possession and use of it in, in some way. It's not. You no, know, I mean it's a, it's a it's you know it's a political issue. Obviously, um, the, even the doctor may have issues by transporting it across state lines. I mean, I, you know. I, although I will say this, there are a number of different. Uh, and if you're, you may be talking about because you see a lot of advertised products about CBD oils and whatnot that you can order online. That may be. You know, uh, the FDA, I, I know of several situations where the FDA, not the DEA, sent out letters to people saying you cannot advertise those products as, you know, medicines. They, they can only be sold as FDA or non-FDA approved like nutritional supplements. There's a big difference in how those t particular things are packaged and marketed. The letters went on to say, oh, and by the way, it has a lot of THC in it and you can't sell it across, you know, because it was, that's the illegality that they get hung up on. But, you know, there are hemp products that are, uh, have uh, CBDs in them, the different cannabinoids uh, that, that, you know, even, even, even test, uh, oh, time's up for, okay. We'll, we'll carry on for, right. finish off this question, that's fine. But, but uh, there are other, uh, you know, products that are sold and marketed that are, um, have similar compounds, and uh, it goes on all the time. You know, it's a question of how they're going to, but at the end of the day, you got to be careful about what you're buying in the mail and uh, what you're shipping in the mail. Okay. So once again, we, we don't have time for any more questions, but again, I hope hopefully the panelists will stay for a couple of minutes afterwards in the hallway or, or here if you have other questions. So thank you so much for handling what's a very challenging topic to discuss, and I think we did it well. So thanks, everyone.